Tugaloo College. Uh, she was on the music faculty at California State University in Long Beach before coming to OU, where she also served as associate dean for the School of Fine Arts. As a musicologist, she has done research on 18th century theoretical treatises and the history of opera, and is the author of several articles on performance practices, opera, and the author George Sand. In addition, she has performed extensively as a pianist and is called upon frequently for vocal coaching and accompanying. She was appointed by governors of Ohio for two consecutive terms as a board member of the Ohio Arts Council. She served as dean for the College of Fine Arts here from 1984 until 1995 and currently is the director of the School of Interdisciplinary Arts. Uh, she teaches courses in the School of Music as well as Interdisciplinary Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, my very great pleasure to present to you Dr. Dora Wilson. accept 
any more money than one dollar per lesson because she saw this little girl had, who had such great musical talent. Barely in her teens, she gave recitals in black churches and schools, and as early as 1916, Roland Hayes took an interest in her, and they performed together in oratorios and cantatas. Roland Hayes is recognized as the first uh, black lyric tenor to be recognized internationally from this country. After graduating from South Philadelphia High School in 1921, her church set up a trust fund so that she could have lessons with a very noted voice teacher by the name of Giuseppe uh, Boghetti, and this was still in Philadelphia. However, after doing so, and she was gaining some notoriety around Philadelphia, she was not allowed to enter the Philadelphia Academy, Music Academy. That's today called the University of the Arts, if some of you are familiar with it, because she was black. In 1925, after winning the first prize, over 300 contestants in a competition sponsored by the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, she appeared as a solo with the orchestra in Lewiston Stadium. And that was an unprecedented event for the time. This really marked the start of her professional career. She, was, she became involved with further study, another noted voice teacher named Frank LaForge. She performed in concerts throughout the US, uh, to which the press paid very little attention. Anderson's performance at London's Wigmore Hall in 1930 was her debut outside of the United States. She continued to study and travel in Europe following the advice of her management. She had a Julius Rosenwald Fellowship, which provided support during this period in, in Europe, a very important period for her. Now, what's become a kind of permanent fixture in musical folklore is a quote from Maestro Arturo Toscanini. He attended her recital at the Mozarteum at Salzburg. She was in Europe. And these, these are the words credited to him. Anything you read about Marian Anderson, you're going to read this quote. Yours is a voice such as one hears in a hundred years. Now, it's felt that this was, had been built up over the years because of publicity, but it doesn't matter because and many, many felt that Toscanini was exactly right, whether he said it or not. Following a series of concerts in 1935, this young black woman, who was given the moniker of the voice of the century, returned to this country having, and this is from one of her biographers, Arsenal, saying, having the imprimatur of European musical royalty and the fervent hope that talent and hard work would triumph over racial prejudice. Anderson's first appearance at Town Hall in New York, 1935, gained high critical acclaim, followed by tours around the United States and in Europe, where she gave concerts in Berlin and um, other leading European capitals, Warsaw, Vienna, uh, Prague, Budapest, a Russian tour, sang throughout Italy. She, had, uh, she went to other countries, Switzerland, Austria, um, Belgium, and even uh, several cities in the Scandinavian area. Anderson's career took a magnificent turn when she was signed under the impresario Saul Pura. And that happened just one year prior to the New York appearance. Now here's what Lawrence Gilman, noted music critic of the New York Herald Tribune, he wrote a review of her Carnegie Hall recital. And here's the quote. Miss Anderson is the sort of person, the sort of artist about whom legends gather. As a child, she lived with her family in a single room in the Negro Quarter of South Philadelphia. And her mother took in washing. She also scrubbed floors. Today, she is called a priestess of lyric art. And selflessness and consecration are compared with those of a few transcendent artists. No one can see and listen to Miss Anderson for two minutes without realizing that one is in the presence of an artist of extraordinary devotion 
intensity, and self-effacement. Her poise, her simplicity, her spiritual transcendence, the mood of exaltation that enwraps her are immediately influential upon all who sit before her." The end of quote. Anderson's career, built on a foundation of talent and fame, included a number of notable events, too numerous to mention here. But a most remarkable event happened in 1939, when the Daughters of the American Revolution in Washington, D.C., refused to allow her to sing in Constitution Hall on racial grounds. Many Americans rushed to her defense and the protests reached the point where others intervened on her behalf to ask the DAR to relax their white artists only policy. But that did not work. Since there was no other space large enough for the many, many fans of Mary Anderson, even they tried a, a high school in the District of Columbia, she ended up having to sing outside. Eleanor Roosevelt and Harold Inky, Secretary of the Interior, offered her the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as the stage for this memorable concert that took place on Easter Sunday, 1939, in front of an interracial audience of 75,000 people. This was the largest open-air assembly yet held in the nation's capital. The concert was heard all over America by radio broadcasts, also arranged by the First Lady and by the Secretary in Iggy's. This very dramatic photograph of Anderson standing before the massive statue of Abraham Lincoln was placed on the front page of many newspapers throughout the country. Again, her biographer Raymond Arsenault says, her bravura performance represented an iconic moment in the history of American democracy. The first time that the modern civil rights movement struggle, excuse me, invoked the symbol of the movement in a direct and compelling way. This 1939 concert became the civil rights event of that period and a step forward in race relations in this country. Although Anderson had not set out to become a symbol of racial pride or racial injustice, I thought what would be better than to let you hear from the people who were there. Remember it is 1939. Uh, there's, there's a PBS uh, production that I'm going to play just a portion of so you can get some sense of what what's going on. Um, let's see if I can get it going. say, mother won't be in to work anymore. Get, you can get somebody else. I didn't say that to her, of course, but that was the meaning. singing the classics drew crowds, but in the South, on every train and bus, in every hotel and theater, her simple presence created a challenge to the tradition of Jim Crow segregation. <coughs> there was the problem of housing. There was the problem of also, shall Negroes be allowed to come in? And then, uh, if that were not a problem, there was also a problem of where are we going to seat them? We got to put them somewhere. 
there were all kinds of problems, of real pain, real anguish. On a daily basis, taking a train, getting a car, getting a meal, getting a hotel room, getting your laundry done, getting your cleaning, finding a place to practice. Everybody takes these things for granted when one travels today. Then you could take nothing for granted except that you'd be shunted to a third or fourth class accommodation and your, some of your personal needs would not be taken care of very quickly. At that time, blacks couldn't sit in the orchestra of an auditorium. They were always confined to the last row of the balcony or someplace like that. And our contracts for Miss Anderson stage throughout the South were that there would be equal seating. And at that time, the house was vertically divided with the blacks on one side and the whites on the other. This was the first time that blacks frequently could sit in the orchestra of a, of a concert auditorium. So in her own quiet way, there was really no civil rights movement at that time. Miss Anderson was already breaking barriers for artists that followed her. Marion Anderson never let racism affect her artistry. She developed a narrow focus on her art that excluded bitterness as well as civil rights activism. This attitude and her enormous talent led to a 1936 White House performance for President and Mrs. Roosevelt. Meanwhile, pressure was growing in the nation's capital for a major concert by Marian Anderson. Cecil Cohen, who was head of the Lyceum at Harvard University, was saying that they had a problem with Miss Anderson. And I said, how's that? And he said, well, you know, our chapel, where we give the concerts only seats about 800. And uh, we, it's just not big enough. People want to hear her. And thousands want to hear her, and we don't know what to do. So I just said, in half jest, but meaning it too, well, why don't you get the uh, Constitution Hall? He said, oh, come on, Todd, you know we can't do that. I said, yes, you can, just go on and get the Constitution Hall. In 1939, Washington's theaters and concert halls followed the policies set for public facilities in southern cities. For example, at the National Theater, blacks could perform, but none were permitted in the audience. Blocks away, at Constitution Hall, Blacks could sit in a segregated section, but no blacks were allowed to perform. In the very beginning of this hall, which was a splendid place, it opened in October 1929. <clears throat> everyone came and everyone appeared. The Negro the tenor Roland Hayes appeared annually. In 1935, there was a change in policy for some reason, and from then on, all contracts for this hall had a clause in it saying, concert by white artists only. The concert committee at Howard University applied to lease Constitution Hall for a performance by Marian Anderson on April 9th. The hall was owned and operated by the Daughters of the American Revolution. The committee then applied to the management here, was promptly turned down, not saying why. They, every date they asked for it was already taken, already taken. Now her manager then was the very astute S. Huron, and he decided that he'd had enough. He called a rival manager and brought him in on this, saying we've got to break this situation in the nation's capital. So he had that manager call to ask about six dates which had been claimed to be taken by others. And he found that they were all available. <clears throat> Hurok then had May Froman call <clears throat> Mr. Hand <clears throat> and confronted him with this, <clears throat> and he was trapped and infuriated. Slammed the phone down saying, no Negro will ever appear in this hall while I am the manager. Now, that was the declaration, an inflammatory declaration, of a prejudice. That's when it began. There was public outrage when word got out that Marion Anderson was being denied Constitution Hall because she was black. Many were shocked at the naked racism. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt resigned in protest from the DAR. On February 19th, the predominantly white school board in the nation's capital turned down a request to use whites only Central High School for a Marian Anderson concert. A lot of important people arose 
to the, to Marion's defense and defense of a black artist right to sing anywhere she wanted to. And Mrs. Roosevelt was one of Mrs. Franklin Roosevelt was one of the first to come to her rescue. I remember that Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes joined, and it was in his domain that the Lincoln Memorial uh, was. So the two of them arranged for Marion to sing on Easter Sunday from the Lincoln Memorial. My feelings was so deep that I have never forgotten it, and I don't think until I leave this earth I will ever forget it. It was the same feeling I had, and I have a dream. Uh, when, when we heard that, I have a dream speech. It was the same feeling. Number one, I, I never have been so proud to be an American. Number two, I've never been so proud to be an American Negro. And number three, I've never had such pride in seeing this Negro woman stand up there with this great royal dignity and sing. Back of me was the Tyler Basin and Washington Monument. Under my feet was the grass. To the side of me, the walls were beautiful trees. Of the ceiling was the sky. And in front of me were these wonderful, majestic stairs going up to the Lincoln Monument. And there stood Miss Anderson. The highlight of that program, the highlight of that day, when this thing became a wonderful citadel, a cathedral, the highlight were the first words that she sang. My country, tis of thee, sweet land, of liberty, of thee I sing. Sang there before. 
She never really appeared after that production was over. Uh, that Met debut made history, both Bing and Anderson. Now, I want to tell you about her Athens visit, um, and I can do it pretty quickly. What is amazing to me is about several years ago when I joined the faculty of interdisciplinary arts, I was wandering around in the room where we keep a lot of books, and I looked on the shelf and I saw a program, and I pulled out, and it had, it was this program. And it's Marian Anderson's program when she came to Athens. I said, oh my goodness, oh my, I, oh, why is this just laying around? <laughs> <laughs> Especially because it's autographed. And so I decided that uh, I'm going to borrow this. I'm going to run to Kinko's and make a copy because I needed a color copier. I brought it back. I framed it. I took it home. I set it on my piano and conversation piece. And eventually I brought it back. <laughs> but I, I don't know where the really original copy came from. It could have been Trisolini who got the autograph. This is 1960 after all. Um, and I just want to close with, I wanted to say some wonderful things, but I wanted you to hear this tape uh, from her. She died at the age of 93, 96 in 1993. Uh, she had the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Kennedy Center Honors, and the very first year they offered those. Uh, it's just so many numerous awards. She was exceptionally talented and lived her life with great poise and di dignity. And in her last thing, a, a quote from her, when asked about uh, her role in promoting racial equality, she said, I am a gentle fighter. My, my mission is to leave behind me the kind of impression that will make it easier for those who follow. And in face of discrimination, Marian Anderson's story is one of strength, consummate professionalism, and dignity while perfecting her artistry as a magnificent singer, who in the words of the critic, Alan Life, had a rich, vibrant contralto voice of intrinsic beauty. Thank you. presented as a sort of fighter, you know, for civil rights. He, he put a lot on the line and part of his career sacrificed because of that. But I can find no... She was truly a soloist. Even when she was offered opera, she refused because she felt she didn't have acting experience, hadn't been on the stage in that way. But she did opera arias in her concerts. <coughs> There's a review of her concert in the post. If you go on the library's website, you can find it. I didn't do that today. Um, it's just straightforward. She did a traditional program, but it's the spirituals at the end that were always so moving. And the, the reporter says, I hope this isn't her last trip to Athens. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I've asked Jeff Shane to introduce our next speaker. Jeffrey Shane from the uh, Southeast Asian Reference Library. I also sort of moonlight as the, uh, the history uh, bibliographer, or now we say uh, subject specialist, uh, and I am proud to do that. Um, uh, and I'm also very honored today to introduce Catherine Jellison. Uh, Professor Jellison received her PhD from the University of Iowa, where she studied under one of the true uh, pioneers in the field of women's history, uh, Linda Kerber. Um, she joined the Department of History at Ohio University in 1993, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. At least that's the information mm -hmm. Sherry gave me. <laughs> she was right. She was right, the fall of 1993. Uh, since that time, she has taught uh, a number of courses, especially uh, undergraduate and graduate courses in women's history but also a number of graduate seminars in ver on various topics in uh, contemporary U.S. history. 
Uh, she is also the recipient of a number of uh, grant awards and fellowships, including awards from the uh, Smithsonian Institute, uh, and also, if I'm not mistaken, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Uh, she is the author of two very well-received monographs, 